the Greco-Roman races. And in the racial hierarchies of the day, that was considered superior. Um, so there's a famous uh, book by L.P. Curtis, and he has a chapter in it called The Importance of Being Catty. And he starts it off by saying, like all other images of other, like all images of other people, nations, and cultures, the English image of Ireland in the middle and later decades of the 19th century was a composite or mosaic made up of many different impressions and degrees of familiarity with the country and its inhabitants. Um, so what I want to tell you a little bit about, and then that first image that we're going to look at, is just what were the images that the Irish were basing their opinions on. So when you think about our contemporary culture, what, is it, what are some of the stereotypes of Irishness that you've maybe heard or are aware of? Anybody? Don't be shy. It's okay. What's that? When we learned something in American history last year, but I'm having a hard time remembering. Like, when they <laughs> That's migrated, okay. When they That's migrated. one of the first things that come to mind. Yeah. Patty. Yeah. Yeah. Holy Columbus. Big families. Big families. Yeah. Catholicism. Catholicism. Drink a lot of whiskey. Yes. Leprechauns. Oh, okay. Okay. So, when I do this with my college students at the beginning of my first year seminar, the first three words I usually get are Guinness, potatoes, and leprechauns, right? So we have, exactly as you guys have identified, we have these images of Irishness in the back of our mind, and those derive from something. And part of what those come out of is this, this history of colonialism. Um, so the, the English... Uh, we're getting their information from a range of sources about Ireland, but remember, this is kind of the mid-19th century. So if you think like 1850s to 1900s, what kind of sources would people have access to for information? The biased ones? Books. Books. Yeah. Anybody else? Newspapers. Yep. Yeah. Right, so newspapers, travel journals, government reports, all written materials. The only images they would have had access to were sketches, um, cartoons in the papers, things that had been drawn by people who visited Ireland. So most people had very little personal experience with Ireland, and a lot of the images they were getting were shaped by British colonial concerns. So you had somebody named John Ruskin, who was a famous Victorian art critic, who said, what I have seen of the Irish themselves in just the two hours after landing will, I suppose, remain as a permanent expression. I had no conception the stories of Ireland were so true. I had fancied all were violent exaggeration, but it's impossible to exaggerate. So you had critics like Ruskin, you had Ruskin, you also had papers like the Times and the Morning Post with statements like, the Irish hate our order, our civilization, our enterprising industry, our sustained courage, our decorous liberty, our pure religion. This wild, indolent, uncertain, superstitious race had no sympathy with the English character. Their fair ideal of human felicity is an alternation of clannish broils and coarse idolatry. Their history describes an unbroken cycle of bigotry and blood. Right. So you can hear some of the negativity in the language that the British are using, and this would have been the popular conception of the Irish at the time. Basically, they felt that everything about British culture was the antithesis of this childlike, primitive Irishman. Um, so you can have you have things like a politician's wife writing home, "What would I not give to help them? But the task is very difficult, and if you give children complete freedom, they will certainly stray." Right. So if you characterize, if you think about it, if you characterize a people as un, uncivilized, primitive, childlike, etc., cetera, um, what historically can that, has that been used to kind of justify? Native Americans in America? Maybe? I couldn't quite hear that. I said Native Americans in America, they used this yep. term. Yep. Slavery? <laughs> yep. Yeah. So think of this in that context. These are those are great analogies for how the British are kind of thinking about and relating to Ireland, right? As a lesser people who need the kind of civilizing influence of Britain, right? So you've got these very racialized and racist sort of hierarchies. And those those statements that I read you are actually some of the more some of the nicer statements that came out at the time. Um, other popular newspapers like Punch portrayed the Irish as um, there's a cartoon that has the title the Irish Frankenstein or the Celtic Taliban, right? So, Lauren, have you guys read The Tempest? No, nobody teaches The Tempest here. So, okay. but, but, but Frankenstein, we're, 
Well, we will be good with soon. Okay. All right. So remember this when you when you read that. Um, so basically, what all of this gets tied to is scientific, um, and I use that scientific in air quotes, understandings of race at the time. So what happens in the 19th century is that during the Victorian period, that's when you have the beginnings of a problematic and ultimately disproven science of race, right? Races were considered either masculine or feminine. The Celts were considered feminine. Um, and manliness as a race didn't just mean courage or strength. It also was tied to this idea of the capacity to, to self-govern and to have your own country. Um, so that first image that I gave you, Lauren, does everybody have access to it? They do, yep. Okay. All right, 